Welcome back to Plakeside Studios, everyone. Ryan here, and on today's explanatory episode, we're talking guitar speakers, the do's and don'ts and using them in your signal chain, and even some of the more popular variants of the legendary Celestian brand. But before that, some merchandise shilling from yours truly. Do you like progressive metal, perhaps even movie scores? Eight stream guitars. Then you're bound to enjoy my first EP, Children of the Stars. Performed, programmed, produced, mixed, and approximately mastered by one dork in a spare bedroom, the debut release from the Seedrum Project is a celebration of all melodic instrumental music. With a smaller art budget than Macaulay Wood's Who Killed Captain Alex, this symphonic metal adventure is not afraid to say, f*** it. Let's see what that sounds like. Not literally, of course, there, there's no lyrics, after all. Get your copy at the link in the video description. Speakers in the enclosures they reside in are unfortunately some of the most overlooked parts of the guitar signal chain in favor of, say, a fancy new amplifier head or whatever boost pedal is trending on the market nowadays. And I would attest that a quality speaker and one that fits the genre you're playing, and especially a cabinet that fits all those things, is among the most important parts of your signal chain, and it's a really easy thing to get right. It's also a really easy thing to get wrong, because if you don't have the optimal setup for the rest of your gear, or especially if you don't record it optimally, then everything up to that point was kind of for naught, and you might as well have gone with a cheaper solution. So we're gonna talk about some of the do's and don'ts, how to set up and match particular speakers to whatever rig you're using, how to do that kind of thing in a virtual sense, and then we'll talk about some of the more well-renowned kind of models from what is perhaps the largest market share holder in terms of guitar speakers. Speakers provide not only a crucial role in terms of your guitar's tone, but the inner workings of the amplifier itself. Obviously, it transfers the electrical energy of an amp into mechanical sound, which is pretty important because that is, after all, how we hear, but it also provides a crucial load on the power section, which is especially important on tube heads because if you do not have some kind of load on those speaker outputs, you're gonna damage or probably even blow a component after a while, especially the output transformer, though it may not even be limited to that based on the circuit you're using. So that's why if you want to record direct, you will need something like a reactive load box to substitute for the speaker. But it just so happens those four, eight, and 16 ohm outputs, or perhaps you even have a selectable impedance thing going on, then that actually coincides with four ohm, eight ohm, and 16 ohm speakers because they are, after all, kind of fancy resistors in the AC world. And that's why you can wire them in series and parallel and get different overall loads. You know, say you got an eight ohm speaker cabinet that has four speakers in it, then they probably wired either four, 16, and various configurations to achieve that overall power rating. So make sure you match whatever number is coming out of the speaker jack to whatever you're going into. There is a realm of safe mismatch. Say if you run an eight and 16 ohm load in parallel, you get something like 5.3 ohms. Technically, it's not a big deal, but I advise against it because we live in a world nowadays where there's so many different little boxes that can combine speaker loads or split amplifiers, and there's really just not a whole lot of excuse anyway. Uh, many amplifier heads or even speaker cabinets have parallel outs, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, if you're going to run, say, two 8-ohm cabinets in parallel, that creates a 4-ohm load. Simple stuff like that. So the main thing is be aware of your amplifier's labeling. Some of them don't do nearly as good of a job as others, like uh, the earlier Randall series heads actually tell you this is for a you know 1x4 or 2x8 load kind of deal. So just be sure you know what you're getting into before you randomly plug things in. But the general rule of thumb is if you're buying whatever accompanying cabinet comes with your amplifier head, the manufacturer's probably already done this work for you and everything should be pretty straightforward. It's really when you start mixing and matching different cabs or even replacing speakers where you kind of have to start thinking about this kind of stuff. Another thing that the manufacturers have probably done for you is power rating because not all speakers are created equally, not only in terms of frequency response, but how loud they can get before they either start distorting or breaking up or failing altogether. That's why a lot of the earlier models of Celestian speakers were blown time after time on some of the earlier high wattage amplifiers because they simply couldn't handle it. You know, something like 
a phone speaker isn't going to be nearly as loud as a 4x12 with V30s. And it's not just down to size and speaker count, it is down to power handling. Now, to be completely honest, talking about stuff like peak power versus continuous power can get really fuzzy. And it appears that the manufacturers here have taken kind of the safe route and conservatively estimated the peak power rating on all their speakers, which is good because that means as long as you stay within that threshold, then you should really never have to worry about damaging any components. So for instance, if we have a speaker that's rated at 50 watts, you can plug a 50 watt amplifier right into it, crank it up to max volume, you should be good to go. Uh, it doesn't mean that speaker isn't going to distort or break up in certain frequencies. And indeed, the power rating is strongly correlated to the overall breakup factor. So, you know, if you have it at bedroom levels, it's gonna stay pretty flat. As you continue to turn it up, you know, the speaker's gonna compress and maybe crap out, as some people would say, and, you know, get some distortion in different areas. In general, the higher power ratings have higher headroom in that sense, in the same way that, you know, say certain tube heads have higher headroom versus their counterparts that distort with less volume or less level, it's the same kind of concept. But the thing to remember with power rating is as long as you have an overall setup that it's either equal or exceeding the power rating of the amplifier you're putting into it, it's golden. And it's actually an additive thing as well. So let's say you have two 25 watt speakers um, that basically turned into a 50 watt rated system. So that's why a two by 12 greenback cab is rated at 50 watts and not 25 watts. Though it's certainly not a hard and fast rule, you might notice that some of the more vintage models we'll discuss in a moment tend to reside on the lower wattage side of things since they were oftentimes paired with lower wattage amplifiers. But then as time went on and amplifier makers tried to fill stadiums with walls of cabinets and amp heads, and the music got more aggressive and amplifiers had more output, then they started making speakers or at least distributing speakers with higher wattage ratings. And that's kind of a, a general rule of thumb I try to stick to. Um, I start looking in the higher wattage areas for high gain tones. And then if I'm doing strictly low gain stuff, I'll start looking in the lower end. But that is certainly not something you have to abide by. Greenbacks sound great on high gain tones just like I've heard great K100 sounds on clean tones. So feel free to experiment as long as you're within the real life limits that these things can handle. Another specification you might notice on the back of a speaker is the resonance frequency, generally ranging between 55 to 110 hertz, give or take. And this has a huge tonal impact, which goes back to the reactive load concept, where if you feed a speaker cabinet different frequencies, it's going to behave in a different manner. Um, in this case, in that low resonance, it actually has a huge spike in those frequencies, kind of scoops out the low mids and continues to climb thereafter. And it has, again, a big impact on the power section. One's not really better than the other. You can kind of compensate with it with different enclosures and um, hell in a amp modeler, you can kind of get rid of it altogether. But that is something to note um, and it's a big concept, a big factor when people talk about a speaker being tighter or more flubby or uh, more punchy in the low end, it oftentimes has to come down to that low end resonance frequency and how it affects the rest of the spectrum. Now stuff like that, and especially the overall frequency output of a speaker is highly dependent on its build quality, the materials used, the coil, the magnets, all these things that you know kind of get thrown in together into this big speaker soup, and then you've got the end product. So digging through the weeds of exactly how each contributes to the overall tone, I don't think is really that important because you can you can just get lost for days on this kind of stuff. My outlook on speakers pretty much mirrors my philosophy on boost pedals or amp circuits, and that there's, there's no perfect component. There is no God tier op amp or uh, you know the one preamp tube to have if you design something around that component in a quality way, you're gonna have a quality product. It's really that simple. So when it comes to speakers, I'm not gonna tell you that this magnet's always better or this voice coil, or whatever. They all have their advantages and disadvantages and it's really gonna come down to your use case, what you're playing and try as many of them as you can. Now, everything up to this point basically doesn't even apply when it comes to impulse responses. So if you're playing a VST plugin, 
or if you have amp modeling hardware, or even you have a direct box to play your amp head through directly to your interface, then you can throw out all that stuff about uh, matching resistance or impedance and the power rating. I mean, you can play an impulse response of a mic'd up five watt desktop speaker. It's not gonna care. It's all post-processing, linear EQ, time-based effects at that point. So um, if you're playing you know, a 120 watt amp model, then feel free to use whatever impulse response you like. If there's a one by six sound you like, then use it. It is really that simple. Um, but in general, everything I'll talk about here forth in terms of the sound and general use of this, these iconic speaker models, it still carries over because they ultimately sound the way they do, you know, when you put them into a digital format. With that said, before we get on to some of the more popular Celestian speaker models, Everyone coming to this video has some kind of bias when it comes to speaker models, whether you realize it or not, and that includes me. You know, everyone has this idea that a greenback always sounds like this, a vintage 30 always sounds like that, 275 is always this thing, or, um, you know, a greenback's always that thing. It's simply not the case because, first of all, there is variance from one speaker to another, so you can, you know, be right off the assembly line and compare two of the same models made from the same batch of materials, and they're gonna sound a little different. Not enough that one stops sounding like the same model of speaker altogether, but you know you can have one golden example of what everyone thinks that speaker should sound like and one that's kind of a dud. So your mileage may vary if you buy a brand new speaker or even if you buy a broken one. Um, it really just comes down to luck of the draw because you have a lot of variance in these kind of manufacturing processes. The second thing, is that what we think a speaker sounds like is highly dependent on the enclosure it's in. If you play a speaker simply sitting on a table, it's gonna sound way different than shoving four of them into an oversized four by 12, or even just a singular one by 12 cabinet because it interacts with that space and it becomes kind of part of that integral sound. And especially if it's open back or closed back, or if it's front loaded, rear loaded, or how it's baffled, a lot of variables there. And then finally, what you hear on recording is not what you hear in the room. If you play a speaker cabinet out loud, you're getting all kinds of reflections from the room and it's dampening treble and presence frequencies and kind of you know enlarging the bass. And then we tend to scoop out mids and dial it in a certain way that when you shove a near field microphone up to the speaker cone, it sounds like garbage on recording. So that's why you know, jamming tones can be a lot different than recording or especially those playing in a live environment with a drum kit and a bass and a vocalist and getting those kind of on stage sounds versus what you're saying to front of house is always kind of a push and pull. And it all has to do with the speaker cabinet and the interaction it has between the enclosure and the speaker and the acoustic space. So that is all to say, when we talk about, you know, a greenback sounds like this or a vintage 30 sounds like that, there's a lot of variables there. However, if you keep everything else the same, you know, if we listen to it from the exact same position using the exact same cabinet, or if we mic it up the same way, and say if you have an own hammer impulse response pack and you can directly compare them, then we can start talking about some of these differences. But again, it's really gonna come down to enclosures. It's really gonna come down to how you're listening to it. And because of that, what we think of as a speaker sound oftentimes has more to do with the overall system more than the speaker itself. In fact, I would go so far as to say that most Celestian speaker models don't sound nearly as different as a lot of people like to make them out to be, at least when played at their nominal levels. That's not to say those minor differences aren't important, how fast the treble rolls off, or if you have a peak or a notch of three to five dB in a really core mid-range, then we're gonna pick up on that. We are sensitive to those kind of sounds. Um, but I think it, it's surprising to some people to see that when we talk about this speaker's tighter in the low end or it's fizzier in the high end, that that doesn't really translate to the frequency output as much as you might think. You know, um, something like a greenback to D30, really not that much difference on paper, but what we hear and especially with how they are used, what amps they're combined with, those little changes make a big difference. So that's why finding the really sweet spot when recording and especially finding a good representation of that speaker in general, it's it's crucial. Um, you, it really cannot be overstated. So with that, let's finally talk about some of the more iconic Celestian speaker models. Uh, this isn't to say there 
aren't great offerings from their competitors. There's plenty of them that I like, whether it be the Jensen speakers of Fender fame or Zach Wilde's obsession with Electro Voice. You got Scumbacks, Warehouse speakers, a lot of great stuff out there. And a lot of the times they have direct equivalents to Celestian models. Um, but when it comes to guitar speakers, what you listen to on the radio when it comes to classic rock to heavy metal, you're probably hearing a Celestian speaker. And if not, it's something based on it. Um, so that's why I'm going to start with this. If you would like to see a rundown of other models, I could potentially do that later on. Um, but I think this is going to cover 90, if not 95% of players' needs. Now, I can't talk about every speaker model, so I am going to limit it to some of the more famous ones and then talk about some that are similar to it if they have you know newer revisions or higher wattage kind of speakers that are tried or at least try to be voiced similar to it. Um, and I'm also going to stick only to 12 inch speakers because again, eight inch can be okay in a lot of areas. 10 inch can be wonderful for clean and you know kind of mid gain stuff, but you know for rock guitar, it's all about 12 inch. Um, I really cannot stand to go any lower for high gain amplifiers, especially in most clean tones. I still prefer a good one or two by 12 um, for even the most pristine of Fender cleans. So. Um, Sorry if you're a 10 inch or eight inch fan, they do make some good stuff as well. But again, it's kind of the iconic sound. Starting on the lower wattage side of things, we have the 15 watt Celestian Blue, sometimes referred to as the G12 T530. This is one of the most iconic speakers in the entire world. And it's completely donned in blue in its speaker frame. It has some really great properties. Um, of course, it's kind of famous for being the Vox speaker for a long time. Uh, this is the Vox AC15 tone as far as I'm concerned. And you can find them in standalone cabinets everywhere in one or even two by 12 formats. It has some really great characteristics once you start pushing it. Again, because it does only have 15 watts of headroom, it'll start to compress at lower volumes than typically you'll find on other speakers. And it's really rich. It's not super glassy. It's not, you know, brittle or, you know, too bass or mid heavy. It's just really well balanced, I think, for clean and kind of edge of breakup tones. Uh, it's one that I tend to favor a lot of the times on fractal audio hardware for clean sounds, whether we're talking about, you know, amps that are kind of like a Vox, like a Morgan or a uh, Matchless Chieftain. It's a really great one. Whether you're an always clean player or more of a progressive kind of guy, give these speakers a chance, especially if you can play through the real deal, but especially in the impulse response world, they just work wonderfully for everything I find. Now, perhaps you have a situation that requires more power draw or power handling, but you need something that sounds similar to this. Well, they do offer gold and cream speakers that offer up to 90 watts of handling, not to be confused with cream backs, the entire thing is colored cream. And just like with anything else, if you change one component in this soup, it's no longer the same speaker, but it is really comparable while handling more wattage. So um, also look into those if you like the blue sound, but don't necessarily have the gear to be compatible with it out of the box. Next up, we have the legendary G12 M25 Greenback used by everyone from Hendrix to Van Halen. This is arguably the sound of rock and roll, though it of course fares really well in everything from twangy tones all the way up to contemporary metal if you use it right. This is also extremely instrumental in shaping the sound we think of when we think Marshall amps because every core plexi recording that we all probably grew up with, good chance we're hearing a greenback speaker. So this is kind of that other side of the British invasion sound, or at least one half of the British invasion. The Greenback's been praised for taming the plexi fizz without completely killing your high end and results in kind of a vocal sounding mid-range honk of sorts that makes it stand out from its peers. Now they also offer other speakers that are kind of similar. There's a 20 watt G12M Heritage, I believe they call it. And aside from some low frequency and I think some stuff past about 4K that jumps all over the place, they are really comparable. So. If you like something that's a little between the wattage capability of say a blue and a green back, then maybe have a look at that one. Overall, they're pretty much the same sounding speakers, especially by the time you mic them up and chop off the low and high end. Um, but for anything from again, those aforementioned plexi tones all the way up to contemporary rock and metal, 
green backs can do it. They're, they're really versatile. Um, and again, the only thing you really have to worry about is the power rating. But if you throw four in a speaker cabinet and wire them up, then you've got something that's 100 watts or less, then they'll probably work just fine for you. Another G12M model that is unfortunately no longer in production is the black back. And looking at it side by side to a green back, they pretty much have the same on paper specs, but the sound profile is that of, well, it's early ACDC in a box without having to turn a single control, and uh, it's glorious. There's even strong evidence to suggest that Metallica recorded with them on Kill 'em All, though that could have been a regular green back. Either way, this speaker is on my bucket list of speakers to own because I love this very specific mid-range crunch. It kind of has this multi-band distortion sound that uh, you don't really hear in a regular greenback. Either way, um, I could foresee an X pattern 4x12 being the best of both worlds. Who knows? The greenback line also spills over into the 30 watt region, although some people stop calling them greenbacks at this point, with the G12, H55, and 75 speakers, the former being the one that Hendrix is known for using, and I think Jimmy Page was even a user of one of these speakers. So this mostly sounds like a greenback. There's a little bit more top end on some of these models, and it's going to kind of depend on which resonance uh, model you have. But it's a different variation of the same sort of sound. But if you're looking for just a slightly different voicing, this might be one to explore. Now they also, confusingly enough, make a G12 creamback anniversary model in the same power rating. If that's, there's going to be one criticism I have of Celestion, their model names suck a lot of the times. Um, there's no standardization between what's a T and an H and an M, and uh, it makes doing this video kind of a pain, but um, you can sometimes follow the N number and it'll tell you wattage. Sometimes you can't. So um, anyway, within that 25 to 30 watt region, you're looking at classic rock tone, though again, it certainly works for way more than that. Sticking with the ceramic magnet design and moving up to the 50 watt region, we have the Celestian A type along with its counterpart, the 70 watt V type. And both of these, at least compared to the last speakers we were discussing, are much more flat in their frequency response. They're still extremely mid focused, but um, much smoother, not nearly as, as jagged or big dips or notches. Uh, the A type has kind of a more harsh fall off after that 3 to 4K region whereas the V-Type is a bit more bright and aggressive sounding. So as you might imagine, they're going after kind of different eras with each one of those and kind of offers a more simplistic speaker to throw in for a all-purpose kind of rig. You'll find these in a lot of not necessarily budget tier amps, but ones that aim for kind of achieving more than one kind of sound. You're not going to see these in, you know, most of the time, a Marshall JCM cab or a Mesa Boogie cabinet or something like that, but maybe perhaps on a lower tier or kind of um, your starting tube amplifier range, these are where you're going to find these. But they're not to say they're bad speakers by any means, they're just kind of aimed for general purpose audiences. We start to see a little innovation in the 60 watt region with neodymium driven speakers, particularly in the Century Vintage and the Neo Creamback, both of which aren't. Extremely common yet, since these are, well, they're fairly new when you're comparing, you know, what, 60 year old speakers at this point, or even further back um, when they were using these variants in like train stations and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, these things aren't exactly like go to sounds, but they are interesting. They're kind of bright and um, sound a, a little unique among their lineup, I think. But the real kicker in the 60 watt area is without a doubt the Vintage 30. You've heard it on everything, basically, um, from thrash metal to contemporary to far back to indie rock. I mean, it's like the speaker to use um, since its release in the 80s. So um, it's arguably been done to death, 
but there's a reason because it just it works it sounds good um it does have kind of a, a spiky mid-range or at least high mid-range presence to it um it does have some thump and it does have a little bit of fizz to it depending on what amplifier you're using with it but anything from marshalls to mesas to diesels to everything in between it just kind of sounds great um and that 60 watt power handling is right in a sweet spot where you know, in a 2 by 12 you get 120. You can still use a full-fledged amplifier head. Um, with a 4 by 12 it can handle about anything. With a 1 by 12 you can still use smaller lunchbox sizes. So there's really no wonder that it kind of took off. You can hear it on all sorts of Pivotal records. Um, you know, Metallica started using them on Black Album. It's a favorite of Megadeth. So I can name you 10,000 artists that use it today. Uh, it's the V30. What else can you say? <laughs> Now there's a bit of a conspiracy with the Vintage 30, and no, it's not that some people think it's rated at 30 watts. That's an understandable gaffe, considering again, they're sort of poor naming, as this doesn't have like a G12V you know, naming scheme. Um, but there was a time, and actually it continues to be in some areas, where this is rated as a 70 watt speaker, depending on who it's sourced to. Um, so if you've got like an older Mesa Boogie cabinet, like my oversized cab, it has four V30s, but the power rating is 280 watts, which would put it at 70 watts per speaker, not 60. Um, also, kind of a similar thing with Marshall-style cabinets, uh, and I think that even continues to be the case on some of them. So it's kind of going to depend on who they're made for. I think Celestion is just kind of, um, you know, rating theirs at a more conservative value. Overall, there might be some tweaks in designs versus a Mesa-specific V30 or a Marshall-specific V30 or one that's just a plain V30. Um, again, I'm not so sure that those differences are any more than just one that comes right off the line after the next. Um, but you know, there are some people that, that say the early 90s made for Mesa vintage 30s are the best ones out there. Others, like me, have a hard time making their mind up and just use whatever <laughs> sounds good at the time. So um, do know that that could be a factor and perhaps that, you know, a Marshall speaker in a Marshall cabinet may not be exactly comparable to the Mesa version of that. But um, again, it's, it's too much for me to even care. A good V30 is a good V30. If the age of the Greenbacks was a real phenomenon, then what followed it should be called the age of the Creambacks with the G12M65, also immediately adopted by many of the prominent players of the late 60s and early 70s. It continued to see all kinds of use into rock and roll and even early heavy metal albums. You hear it across all sorts of Bay Area thrash stuff. And it has a really crunchy, high mid sort of thing. It was kind of the vintage 30 of its time, I would say, before the V30 was a thing. And there's even a modern take on it with the G12H75, which kind of handles the bass and high end a, a little bit more consistently, um, but otherwise still has that iconic uh, middle response. So this is a really great classic speaker if you want something that kind of sits in between, in my opinion, the older greenback sound and something out of a more contemporary speaker design. That, of course, brings us to the love it or hate it G12T75, one of the most controversial speakers in the lineup from Celestion, which I think is unfortunate because it's among my favorite for distorted tones. And I think a lot of people who really like certain high gain guitar tones uh, don't realize that it's coming from the speaker. Um, Yngwie Malmsteen, Meshuga, you name it. Uh, there's all kinds of great examples of this speaker in a 4x12 Marshall cab. Um, I kind of get why some people aren't crazy about it because they try to treat it like a greenback and a greenback it is not. Uh, though I don't blame them because this is sort of touted as the high watt version of that. But um, it kind of has a weird sizzly three to 4,000 hertz thing going on that you don't hear. Um, it is a little more scooped. It kind of sits between 
um, you know, maybe a V30 and a cream back in terms of voicing, but it, it definitely has its own thing. Um, I don't like it as a standalone speaker all the time, unless we're talking like a really good example of a JCM 900 or a modern Plexi derivative, um, say like a Friedman amplifier. But you blend it with a V30, uh, say like a Bogner Uber cab that offers that. Ah, beautiful. That is the exact sound you're hearing on uh, my last EP. And by the looks of it, you're going to keep hearing that sound in the uh, the next couple of them. So uh, it's an awesome combination. It's kind of old school at this point, which is weird to say. But uh, yeah, great combination between two speakers and even on its own. Like I said, it's good enough for one of the best shredders of all time uh, who plays through a lot of legendary Marshall amps. So uh, it's definitely workable. <laughs> Now into the 80 watt region, we're starting to get into some decently high powered speakers. We have the Classic Lead and 7080, both of which share a lot of the same sort of sound signature, though the 7080 in particular has a big scoop after about 10K. Not that big of a deal on a guitar anyway. Um, these are speakers that, especially with the 7080, these are kind of like general purpose, you know, try to design something that works well for everybody. Um, the 7080 in particular can be found on all kinds of third-party cabinets and combo amps. Um, it's one that is fairly well-reviewed for what it is. Again, it's not one of those classic speakers that uh, you hear and go, oh, that sounds like Led Zeppelin, or that sounds like ACDC, or that sounds like this band, um, because it's just not been out that long, and the amplifiers and cabinets, again, that it accompanies aren't in the highest tier. You know, your, your general uh, boutique or you know really well-known names are going to continue to use these classic speakers but um, you know as someone who had like that solid state Marshall MG 250D FX I wish it had came with 7080s at the time uh, that would have been a huge upgrade over the crap that it shipped with so um, that's why I don't view this as a bad speaker whatsoever in fact um, maybe if I find one cheap enough I'll, I'll do just that so expect it to see in, in that kind of price bracket um, but don't you know, snarl your nose at it. I, I think it's one that can definitely be useful. At 90 watts, we have another speaker in my collection, the Mesa Boogie C90 Black Shadow. This one's really interesting to me because I got it primarily for a clean speaker. I wanted something that was comparable in power to everything else I was using, but uh, just had a different sound to it. So I wanted a one by 12. I'd really like to have a second one at some point. Um, but it really surprised me because it does distorted tones way better than any 1x12 should. Um, you know, putting a Mark series amp or a rectifier through it, it still sounds like you would expect. Um, not quite as full bodied as a 2x12 or especially 4x12, but uh, it, it really speaks to their, their cabinets, I think. But um, this could be found on like Mesa Boogie Mark III half stacks and even in combo amps in the Mark IV and Mark V today. It's um, a bit of a bright speaker, and so I think if you have particular settings, you might have to dial back the presence or treble, or especially the graphic EQ on a Mark series head. But um, I would gig with it, you know, I would record with it. I really look forward to recording with it seriously. Did country tones with it. I've, you know, played around with rockability, classic rock. It's nuts. It's a really cool speaker.
breaking triple digits, we have the massive G12K100, both in terms of tone and weight, considering that it clocks in at about 10 and a half pounds or nearly five kilograms for those of you across the pond. This thing can kind of be considered the big brother to the T75. It, it shares similar tonal qualities, uh, just bigger in <laughs> about every sense of the word. It's really not that popular. I know Frederick Thorndall likes them. Um, not that I know he's recorded with them, but you can see them in diesel cabinets and some custom stuff. I think Mick Thompson used them in his uh, Rivera stuff. That's about it that I, I can name off the top of my head. They're not particularly popular, but um, they are an interesting design nonetheless, considering that you could put a full-fledged 100-watt tube head through one of these. So that's, you know, two stereo power amps and a 4x12 that you could drive. It's just not necessary <laughs> anymore. But perhaps you're after their tonality instead, so you can certainly find impulse response packs that have the speaker model. But what if 100 watts isn't enough for you? How about 150 with the H150 Redback? There are you know, higher wattage speakers um, and other companies' offerings, but uh, at this point, we're kind of against the ceiling of what you would ever need for a guitar amplifier. Um, this seemingly shares some Creamback greenback properties just turned up to 150 and i've only ever seen it sold in like standalone one by 12s which makes sense because why would you need more uh and a couple demos that people swap them out but uh can't really get a great read on this not all that popular yet i think you can ascertain why uh, and it's more of a it, just an interesting case to ponder more than anything but uh yeah they do make them all the way up to 150 watt power ratings and beyond for some of their larger speakers, but um, that pretty much covers the models. My overall approach and advice to speaker sounds pretty much falls in line with my uh, philosophy I stated earlier in the video in that I tend to prefer low wattage stuff for cleans and break up and then, you know, climb up to 60, 75 watts when we're talking about high gain, though there are certainly outliers like the Mesa C90, sounds great and about everything, uh, but you know, we're talking clean to break up tones, Celestian Blue, Greenbacks, Creambacks, uh, particularly the Greenbacks and Creambacks continue to sound great all the way up through, you know, overdriven JTM45 or Plexitones or anything in that region. And then, you know, start breaking that barrier. That's what I start to prefer, Vintage 30s, T75s, um, still like 65 watt Creambacks. And uh, the C90 continues to sound great. So um, I always like experimenting with them. Again, I wish other companies had a little bit more presence in some of these IRs especially and uh, hopefully I'll find some that I'll continue to grow my collection with but yeah pick like two good speakers and you're done <laughs> um, in terms of tones that's that's all you really need um, and there's plenty of them out there that can do everything but again I find that it's those little differences and how they interact with amps and how they you know attenuate or boost certain core frequencies there that make it kind of the, the match between the two where you don't have to break out EQ pedals or post-processing to get it to sound right. So that's pretty much Celestian speakers and some of the basics of using them in your signal chain. Any other questions, comments, please leave them down below. And I'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.